if there's an emergency, and there's another one out the main doors, and if you assemble across the, um, in Bering Square East, if we fire alarms, we then goes off, uh, probably easier to get that one than that one at the moment. Um, toilets just around the corner if you need them, and at the end we're going to have um, tea and coffee, which will be just behind us, so, and that, that'll be an opportunity for you to um, have a chat one-on-ones with us as well. So. Um, we're also live streaming this um, session, so it's being streamed as we speak. Um, so if there's any questions in the crowd, we'll have Femke who will take them, put your hand up if you have a question, Femke will take the microphone around so you'll need to speak into the microphone, otherwise those people at home won't be able to hear what um, you're saying. We would hear you, but they won't. Um, so we'll use that. So I'd like to welcome you all here tonight to this long-term plan. And I have councillors here. I've got Councillor McMillan, Hooper, Brahm, Lovett, Alice, Cameron, Todd and Wilson here. So um, we've just about got the full crew apart from one who's um, away at the moment, one councillor. And we also have staff. We've got Mark, Femke, Tony, Neil, Janice, Paula and Leanne here as well to um, do the, the backstage uh, stuff for us. That's good. Um, so good evening and thank you for joining us tonight. <clears throat> and I want to just jump straight into it. Why are we here this evening? And we're here to talk to you about our draft long-term plan. Over the past year, Council's been working on the plan for the future of our district. During the last uh, year, we've, been, we've asked for input from the community during the Take 10 for Our Future campaign, and now we're keen to get the feedback from everyone on the draft, and I'll say it's a draft plan. A lot's happening in our district. We're changing and growing, and we want to make the most of the opportunities this brings. We have a vision to make our district the district of choice for lifestyle and opportunity, and we've made great progress over the last three years. We've opened this fantastic new library and civic centre facility. We've done the installation of new water treatment facilities and water storage in Methven. We've upgrading large, we have upgraded large sections of our 2,600 kilometres roading network, as well as the Ashburton CBD. But there's still more to do. And we face some tough choices, so it's important to acknowledge that even though we could want to do everything, we can't afford everything. It's important to us that you understand how these proposals affect you, including how much they will cost the district. There are five specific key decisions we're specifically asking community feedback on, and we call them our five for the future, and we'll discuss these in depth later. At this stage, we think we've got the balance right during this consultation, but during this consultation, we need to hear from you on what you want us to do. For some key decisions, there's also the option of doing nothing. And <clears throat> it's all on itsourplace.nz, and you can find the additional background information that is, that'll be the easiest place to find it, and it'll be the easiest place to make a submission. So today's purpose is about talking about the long-term plan and the issues we are seeking feedback on. What is the long-term plan 2024 to 2034? Every three years, we put together a long-term plan which sets out what we plan to do over the next 10 years and how it will be paid for. It includes detailed information on when, where, and how for each activity, service, and projects we want to deliver. Developing this long-term plan is a big piece of work, and it's been developing We've been developing this plan over the last 18 months, and we've had many conversations about it. The earlier feedback received through Take 10 for Our Future engagement, engagement campaign gave us some really valuable insight about the district's priorities, and we have used feedback for the plan. What we present to you here is what we believe is the best path forward, but I will, we are keen to hear if you think we've got it right. And as I said, it's a draft plan. <clears throat> to ensure we meet the current and future needs of our community, we have a vision and we have four community outcomes which help guide the decisions we make. And they are economic, environmental, cultural and social well-beings. The focus of this long-term plan is we'll keep doing the basics with an emphasis on improving roads and other essential infrastructure like water. We're working with the government to get the second bridge built. We're maintaining and developing parts, parks, upgrading recreational facilities like the Ashburton Art Gallery Museum, memorial halls, etc. Maintaining delivery of regulatory services like building regulation and animal control, and we're even developing elderly persons housing. We're consulting on the whole long-term plan, which is more than just five key issues. 
financial strategy, infrastructure strategy and other supporting information and long-term plan policies. We're also consulting on the EA Network Centre Master Plan alongside this long-term plan. There are five specific key decisions we're specifically asking community feedback on, and we're calling them five for our future, and we'll discuss those in depth later. But we're also asking feedback on everything during this consultation of the plan. <coughs> Some of the challenges. Our draft long-term plan is focused around improving our community's wellbeing. And there are several challenges that are running in the background that impact what we are doing in here. And these are summarised on the slide. Government changes. We're adapting to changes with how the government wants local government to provide services. There have been two different governments during this planning period and some significant changes are currently being reversed. We have infrastructure investment. So our key assets, some of our key assets are reaching the end of their life. We need to invest more to keep them up to scratch and provide services safely to the community. This includes our drinking water, wastewater and stormwater systems and roads, of course. Cost of delivery, the service, cost of delivery increase. Running a district doesn't come cheap. Much like many households in New Zealand, we're facing the big increases to all the costs of providing our services to meet these inflationary pressures and realise our plans for the district overall. Rates, uh, overall rates are proposed to increase about 30% in the next three years, and that's including inflation. It sounds a lot, but this translates to around an additional $300 annually for an average Ashburton residential property. Community development. We want to remain the district of choice for lifestyle and opportunity, which means that apart from delivering our current services, we want to remain attractive for our current and future communities. And the long-term focus on, um, with climate change and resilience, and resi resilience is an ever-present issue and needs to be built into our planning. Before we get to the five key decisions, I'd like to explain what a preferred option means. The option that Council currently favours is called the preferred option. The costs of this option are included in the long-term plan budget, and we're seeking feedback on all these options presented. Following public feedback on the draft long-term plan, or if we learn of new information, Council may change its preferred option. So it's important we hear your views on each of these key decisions. And I'm just saying we must have a preferred option, but that doesn't mean we've made our mind up. We're here to listen to you. I'll hand over to Councillor McMillan now to take you through the first key decision. Thanks, Neil. Good evening, everyone. I <laughs> need to be on my tiptoes. Um, so our first key decision, and if you've got one of the um, long-term plan booklets in there, you'll see all that information in there as well, um, is regarding our curbside green waste collection and what that would or could look like in the future. Um, so in 2027, we are going to be required by government to provide a food waste collection service. In past years, we've had a lot of feedback about having a green waste bin, and I think we've possibly one of the few Canterbury um, councils that don't have a green waste bin um, currently. So we know now that there's a lot of people who will put their grass clippings or um, branches or anything sort of um, organic into the red bins at the moment and of course all of that gets carted up to Cape Valley. So our options um, we have, uh, we've got two options for this, and either to introduce a green waste collection service, which would be a larger 240 litre bin that you could put your food scraps, I think I'm talking to the right side, food scraps and all your garden waste. And that would mean that that would save sort of 43% of organic waste that's currently going into our red bins. The other option is um, to only provide the mandatory food waste service. So this is a wee 23 litre bin. Have we got the bins? Uh, they're at the entranceway, I think, so you can see how big they are. Is that right? Um, 
and that would only be for food scraps and that would be put out weekly. Let me see that up there. Um, so the other two options, I've, I've got the easy part tonight, I think. <laughs> um, so it's whether we have a larger bin of, of 240 litres, which is going to cost roughly 70 to, an extra $72, so I think that's around $1.38 per week, um, or the smaller 23 litre um, bin, which is just for food scraps, collected weekly, $35 per year, and, or 67, uh, 67 cents per week, and that would, um, that is mandatory in 2027. I see we've got a question. So to, um, to clarify on that, the, the big bins are also for food scraps as well. Yes, as they will be, yeah. yes. I mean, the small ones, I, I can see a great deal of issues with, um, you know, them being put out on the side of roads and animals getting into them, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm very, like, you've, you've consulted on green waste bins before, and, and, and I, I support the big green waste bins, yeah, but the smaller ones I could just <laughs> see more of a hassle than, than anything. Yes, I mean, um, Auckland City Council, would have, they have them in place at the moment, I don't know how long they've had them in place, um, the food scrap bins, and we have had a wee bit of feedback from that, that um, they're not ideal, but that's that's what we want to hear from you, what you would prefer. Yep, so that feedback's good. Oh, we'll just wait till the microphone comes and then people at home can hear you as well. Um, probably I would feel that a lot of older people would struggle with putting very much into a 240 bin. Um, and they usually have people coming around to do their lawns and their clean up of their property, so would only need a small one, where somebody like me who does do lawns um, and does do gardens would need the, the bigger one for my garden stuff, but I have a compost that all my food stuff goes into. Is there a, a chance of having the option? Currently, no, so we're not having an opt-out option, um, but that's where everyone's feedback will come in. So obviously our preferred option is the bigger bin because that's the feedback we've had up until now. And, and when we had the, the yellow and the red bins when we started those, there was an option for the green waste, but it wasn't included at the time. So that's the kind of, when you make your submission, that's, that's what we want to hear and the reasoning behind why. Any more questions? All good? Okay, I'll hand over to Phil for the next key decision. Excuse me, I'm not used to this public speaking bit. Key decision number two, if we invest in water-based leisure, where should it be? Over recent years, we've received requests from the community for various water-based leisure facilities. Each of the four projects we've explored is expected to cost around $3 million, slightly more for hydroslides. And while we'd like to complete them all, we can really only afford to proceed with one or we can do nothing. So those five options, refurbish the Timwall Pool, new water play area at the Ashburton Domain, Council's preferred option, the new outdoor pool at EA Network Centre, hydroslide at the EA Network Centre or do nothing. Stick a wee bit deeper, option number one, refurbish the Timwall Pool. And a couple of pros and a couple of cons with this. The pros, it responds to requests of the community and retains the Timwall Pool for use. And the facility is brought up to modern New Zealand pool safety and water quality standards. On the flip side, Cost to repair does not include an upgrade to other parts of the facility, so those changing sheds over there would stay the same. High costs for fairly limited usage, and it would not solve the lifeguard shortage issue. Question I've been asked a lot, why does it cost $3 million to upgrade the Timwall Pool? 
Well, for the pool to meet New Zealand standards for pool design and water quality, it requires significant work both above and below ground to improve circulation as well as a commercial plant to support water treatment and filtration. Option two, new water play area at the Ashburton Domain. A couple of the pros, remains a free activity and therefore has less barriers to use than other options and it does not require lifeguards and is not restricted by opening hours. On the flip side, the Tamil pool would be closed and it doesn't appeal to a broader age range. Option three, the new outdoor pool at the EA Network Centre. A couple of the pros for this, longer opening hours than the Timmel pool due to the flexibility provided by lifeguards already stationed at the EA Network Centre. And customers would be able to utilise the other EA Network Centre facilities. On the flip side, once again, Timmel pool's closed. It wouldn't solve swim school capacity issues during the colder months either. either. Option number four, Hydroslide. It's available for use all year round. It meets the requests for more activities for younger people within this district. Timor Pool will be closed, and the other con that I highlighted was depending on the design, this option may not be able to be used by younger kids, say, under fives. And finally, there's an option to do nothing. Of course, ongoing operating costs will be minimal, only the existing Ashburton Domain paddling pool, and no additional debt. Once again, though, the cons, the Timor pool will be closed, and it does not meet community requests for more recreation options for young people, an upgraded paddling pool, or to save the Timul pool. Any questions? So, with the two Ash Burden um, EA networks, the hydroslide option and the pool, um, can you comment further on? the costs of it and whether they will be uh, self-sustaining from fees charged to enter the, the uh, pool or how much of that's coming from fees and how much of that's coming from rates? As I mentioned, um, the, all the options are around three million. Uh, I understand there would be a separate charge for the hydro slide on top of your swim. Um, and all the other information you want is at itsourplace.nz. Is it self-sustaining or is it going to be I, I haven't got a crystal ball. No uh, I'd dare say for a start, it certainly will be and probably <laughs> profitable. No pools or stadiums are self-sustaining. There's always rate power money going into them, so the additional pool would still be having rate power money going into it. Even the hydro slide would, even with a charge. So, so there will be rate power money going. Uh, the existing EA networks facility at the moment is one third, two thirds. One third fees and charges, about two thirds council rates. Hi, we have a question from Facebook from Dave. Um, he's asking, does the council contribute to the cost of the other pools in the region, such as Methven and Rakaia, etc.? Yes. Do we need to go there further? So Methven gets a targeted rate and there's a grant for the other community um, country pools. 50,000 in total. Would the option three, the outdoor pool at the EA Centre, um, would that be able to be used by the schools in the summertime for school programs? Potentially. Because that then would enable more pupils to use the 
Are you thinking about the capacity for the swim schools? That's already so like been reached. And intermediate to be yeah. able to use the swimming pools. Yeah. Because most of them don't have a swim program during winter time anyway. But in the summertime, they're struggling to get times into the pool. So yep. if the outdoor pool's used, well, then that would in in yep. increase the capacity. Yeah. That's us. I'll hand over to. Ooh. Um, I haven't got a question, but I've got a comment that I think um, it's very hard to compare a pool at EA Networks, an outdoor pool there, or a pool at Tinwald. Um, EA Networks is a re recreational facility where people go for fitness and whatever, but Tinwald is a destination for families, and with the pond, the um, playground, the tennis courts and everything else, I just believe that um, the pool tops things off over there for... And I've been there and had many organisation picnics and it's wonderful to, and I've taken grandchildren to the pool. And I do believe that if it was upgraded or a new pool built there, then they would have, um, the, the, they would have much more um, clientele and that you may not run at a, the loss that you think you would. Thank you. And I also believe that maybe um, clubs like Rotary and Lions and whatever and some voluntary work may well help with building sheds and, and facilities over there that are required. Um, I think the local community would get behind it. Thank you. Please do let us know with a submission. Please let us know with a submission. There's another uh, question here from Dave on Facebook, and he's asking if a similar option uh, has been considered to keep the Turnwood Pool open, um, a council-private partnership? Uh, a private partnership, you're talking a key system, I assume? No, it hasn't been considered. MK. Yep. We welcome Dave's submission. Why is it considered that an outdoor pool is necessary, given that it's season limited and has higher maintenance than an indoor pool? Uh, it's just that's the council's option. And um, as, as Neil said, we do need to have one for budgets. So if, if that's not your idea or what you like, then you need to let us know. It's not set in stone. Yes. It's us. I hand over to Councillor Ellis. Good evening. Um, I get key decision number three. What do we do with the Balmoral Hall in the old Polytech land in Ashburton? Council owns the Balmoral Hall, an old Polytech site on Cameron Street. Um, even though Balmoral Hall is not classified as a heritage building, it was built in 1936 and has been used by many generations of people in Ashburton since. But the hall needs extensive repairs. It leaks, contains asbestos, and requires modern kitchen and bathroom facilities. On the Polytech site, the main classroom is ageing and also requires significant work. Both sites are used by community groups but are not used enough to cover the maintenance costs. Belmoral Hall is valued by the various community groups that use it for its lower fees and by the dance groups for its fantastic sprung floors. 
If the hall is sold or demolished, we propose to build a multi-use stadium at EA, Net EA Network Centre to cater for dance. There are three options that Council are looking at for the Balmoral Hall, and Council prefers option two, as we um, think that this is the most financially responsible option, to help reduce debt and free ratepayers from ongoing maintenance costs. And the modern multi-use studio at EA Networks would provide a modern venue for dance. So moving on to option one, which is to retain and repair the Balmoral Hall and Polytech site. Just remembering in its budgets, Council has not allowed for any money to be spent on the hall, in fact the reverse, it has allowed for money to come in from the sale of the buildings and land on that big site. Um, but option one is by far the least disruptive for the dance studios and users of the um, hall. Um, but will require spending a significant amount of money to retain the same level of service. Fees for the user groups would have to um, increase to help cover those repair costs. And general ratepayers would continue to subsidise the operating costs of the Balmoral Hall. Also would need to find funding to repair the old Polytech site and secure some long-term tenants. Servicing that debt would cost the ratepayers of Ashburton $388,000 per year. Option two, sell both sites, and this is Council's preferred option. Um, proceeds from the sale would be used to reduce Council debt. It saves around $45,000 each year in costs, and a new space for dance would be developed at EA Network Centre. On the flip side, community groups would lose their access to the current facilities. The dance studio proposed at EA Network Centre would be smaller and more expensive to hire than the current space at Balmoral Hall. And if the Balmoral Hall was demolished, it would be seen as a loss to our district's heritage. Option three is to demolish or re relocate the buildings and redevelop the site. Um, this enables Council to keep ownership of that land and decide what its future use may be. Um, and, and at this stage, Council hasn't considered that until this process is finished. So, um, and then with that, obviously, we still uh, redevelop the new space at EA Networks for the dance studio. Demolishing the hall would be seen as a loss to our district's heritage. And the space down at EA Networks, as I said, is smaller than is currently being used. So that is another disadvantage. So they are the three options that Council have put out there for feedback. Um, and I'm sure I'm going to get some questions here. I, um, the community needs places for some of these lower cost places to go to. The EA Centre is not going to do it because it's just a hassle to get there a lot of times for them, and it's going to be expensive. Can they not just build another hall that meets the standards and try to keep the cost down for people? The Polytech, if it's been used by, I don't know how many groups use the Polytech, um, can that not just, because I don't think it's fully used, is it? No, no. So can not extra rooms be put on a new hall just on the Balmoral Hall site and maybe sell a Polytech site and, and keep the costs down so that some of these smaller community mm. groups can use them at a reasonable price without not being able so to do anything. Are you, are you saying with that, demolish the Balmoral Hall and build a new hall in yes. its space, but a smaller one well, you're that saying, meets... You're saying that the costs of... For a state, you're never ever going to move those buildings. Uh, some of the ones on the Polytech site you can. There's prefab buildings there. This council will never ever move a building that's full of asbestos because you say it's full of asbestos. Uh, the hall there. is, but those prefab buildings um, are not. Yeah. Down. So. Um, you've got to find, you've, there's got to be some places for some of these smaller groups to be able to go to the dance club so that your two, three, four, five year olds can yes. go dancing at an affordable cost. Mm. And I think that if you're going to build a stadium at the EA centre to cater for that, these groups are not going to be able to carry on. You need to be able to build something that's affordable 
reasonable centre of town car parking and maybe pulling down the Balmoral Hall and replacing it with a similar size hall with some extra rooms on the outside that, that similar to what Polytech are using now would be the option rather than making it on the other side of town that some people can't necessarily get to. Fantastic. Look forward to that coming through so we can consider that option around the table. Um, I would just like to say that um, Charmaine from Danceworth sends her apologies tonight and can't be here. But we've hired that hall for 30 years and Charmaine has been dancing there for 50 odd years. And I'd just like to say that we've never seen any maintenance done the whole time we've been there. We've had to go along to the council and pick up, buy 20 cent pieces of old, old 20 cent pieces to put in the slot machine to get power and none of the half the um, heaters even work. The, the slot machines would run our stereo, plus the heaters. And I see an expenses there that says that it's for electricity, but I'm not sure what that is. I've requested a breakdown of your last year's expenses of $44,733. And I just don't know where you've spent that, to be perfectly honest. And also the income, between Charmaine and ourselves, we've spent more, we've given you more income from our rent than you have put in here, and there's been other church groups in that, that have hired that hall, and it's not in there, so I cannot see that your figures are correct. The other thing is this quote here that you've got from, um, you're saying it's 1,249,000, uh, which you're rounding it up to 1.3 million, so there's 50,000 there for a start, is a year old, but it's also only from a um, consultant. Why don't you go and get a proper quote from a building company to get the correct figure that you're giving to the public, to the ratepayers, to choose? It feels like that you're just upping these prices and that you're not putting the correct income in. I, I can assure you we're not upping the prices. Um, if the option of, of um, doing up the hall and, and retaining the site is what we end up with around the table after all the feedback, we would then go to a tender process for that work, um, which would then give us those accurate figures, but, um, but you do need to get a consultant to go through first to give you that idea of cost so you know where you're working. Uh, th <clears throat> uh, th thank you, Councillor Ellis. Um, I quote you, provide a space in EA Network Centre for dance. What would that entail? Would that entail covering the outdoor courts for them? Uh, would it squeeze another group out? Would it make it all tighter? What, what the words you used? So what does that mean? We're some internal alterations of the space in there around where sports house and that sort of thing is, um, is where we would be looking at making room. Oop, Angus would like to... Sup a supplementary question. <laughs> well, sir, um, if doing away with Radiant Hall is a no-cost option, how much would it cost to make EA Network acceptable for dance and activities that are now held in the Radiant Hall? Uh, sorry, in, in the, the Radiant Belmore Hall. Because there must yeah. be a cost to alter. Something. Yes, it's on page 29 of um, your document you had there. And, yep. And the cost was, just since I haven't got it in front of me? 325. 325. Thank you. Thank you. Don't, don't run away. <laughs> And we asked what kind of floor you'd have in that room and we haven't got an answer for it yet. Is it going to be concrete with vinyl on top? Is it going to be dance floor? Sure. What's it going to be? I'm, do you know? The, the design still be done, but I understood that they would cater to the dance, maybe there would be some form of stuff. Yeah. Oh, actually, I, can I come back to you on that? Because I'd rather give you an accurate answer than... But, we, we want to cater to your group, so we want to. Um, we don't want to give you a concrete floor, if you like. That. So, so what yeah. you're 
you're asking the right powers to vote on this, but you're not telling us what the alternative is. Yep, I will find the, out for you. But will you tell all the right powers that are voting on this? I, I will ask our media team to put that information out there. In the public yes. forum. The other thing is, do you realise the, the, the value of that wooden floor that's in that hall? I, I, I understand it will be in a very expensive floor. Yeah. So that floor is a very good floor for dancing. Yes. And if you'd have kept it up with your maintenance that we're paying rent, if you'd put just a little bit in every year that we've been da dancing there, surely that would have been fine. And it's a very good floor. And it would be such a shame to see that you demolish it and chuck that wood out. Yep, understand. Oh, can I ask, um, you saying two sites, is it an option to sell the Polytech site but retain the Balmoral Hall site? Anything is an option. So, so put a submission in um, and then we can look at that around the table as well. Hi, I've got a question from Tanya on Facebook, and her question is, why is council pushing for everything to be at EA Network Centre? Where is parking going to be with all these extra proposed builds? Okay. If, if you look at the master plan that's come out in conjunction with the um, long-term plan, you'll see there's a lot of additional car parking planned at the far end of the stadium. as I see it, and I don't think it's really conducive to having a dance studio there. I live, <coughs> on, the, excuse me. I live on the western side of the um, council land there, and I can hear, uh, and probably once a month, I can hear the music quite loud at my place, and I just don't really feel that the dance studio or that uh, department should be at the EA Networks anyway. Uh, I think it would be a bad decision. Thank you. Hi. I'd rather um, uh, want to know why is, are you guys concentrating just on the dancers in the Balmoral Hall? It's a hall that is in the middle of town, right? It's a good sized hall. It's the perfect sized hall. You've got things like the Tinwald Hall and the Hotel Ashburton, but when you go to hire a hall in this place of Ashburton, it is hopeless. Now, I can't see why that, that hall cannot be done up to look beautiful. You could have weddings, funerals, and God knows what else in there, and make some money out of the damn thing, rather than just let it go there and rot away and Everyone's moaning about it, so uh, that's my point. Thank you for that. If enough people tell us that around this table, we will be making that decision. But that's why we seek this feedback. This is probably just outside the hall thing. When you're self-employed, you have depreciation of product, right? And, and you generally would put aside money so that you can replace that product in the future when it, its shelf life is finished. Does the council do that? Yes, it depreciates. So why do we have to keep borrowing so much um, money to be able to cover these new projects? And also, Mr Brown, if we're paying $300 extra a year, which is a 30% amount of the general rates, what property have you got that you're only paying a thousand dollars a year rates on? It's extra rates. Yeah, it's extra above what you're already paying, so it's not. Yeah, but by my rates, about two thousand eight hundred, so thirty percent of that is seven hundred and twenty dollars, not three hundred. Thirty percent over three years. Yes. A year. mm. It's ten percent a year, not thirty percent. Yeah. Nothing else. Cool. Who's next? So I'll hand the floor over to Richard.
Evening, every oh, turn that Evening, everybody. Um, I'm here to talk about Stockwater. Okay, we'll start off with fourth decision is whether we remain in the Stockwater business. Our ageing Stockwater network is an inefficient and expensive way of delivering water to livestock, but it does have benefits for some of the community. We currently operate 1,600 kilometres of Stockwater races, providing water for livestock to about 1,000 properties. The water primarily is used for animals, but there are many other benefits, like supporting biodiversity, providing food sources, mahangakai, and land drainage. Over the past two decades, the Stockwater Network has more than halved as landowners request closures because they have switched to piped water or other sources. The service also relies on having sufficient water to keep races flowing, but Council cannot guarantee that there will be enough water, especially in the hot, dry summers like we've just experienced this year. We're also facing new environmental requirements that will add significant extra costs to the system, such as new fish screens at the top, which, you know, over the last four or five years, environmental um, levels have increased. So th that's one of the stock water is one of those places where those, those costs have, have landed, you'd say. There are three options. Council prefers option three, as the network's increasingly inefficient and expensive to maintain. We think exiting the service is the most sensible option. This, this will provide a three-year period for current users to make alternative arrangements, such as sourcing piped water from irrigation schemes. So now we'll go to the options. Option one, stay and invest. So the pluses to this is current users will continue to receive the service. So it would continue like it is, and if we invest, there'd be fish screens, there'd be more, a lot more cost put in. The downside is significant investment required for a relatively small amount of users. This won't stop people wanting to close races, because if we stay and invest, people may still want to get rid of them. And also, it remains an inefficient approach for delivering water for agricultural purposes, because piped water is much more efficient. You don't have the losses. You don't have contamination, that sort of stuff. Option two, maintain with, with a closure program over time. The positive to this is current users will continue to receive the service again, but the downside, council having no active investment may compromise the future of the system. So you'd still be left with the same infrastructure we had, less reliable, it's sort of running down the asset. There's no planned approach to, to, to decommissioning the service. This would increase in uncertainty, so we've got no plan effectively in this one. Costs would keep escalating for a decreased number of rem remaining users as further races were closed, because cl races would close as time went on. And option three is exit the Stockwater service by 30th of June 2027. I note that this is the Stockwater service we're exiting. Uh, the pluses of this, Current users will continue to receive service until closure. That means they've got time over the next three years to look at their options, think of what they need for their stock water requirements. Water would be better managed through, an efficient, through other efficient services, which is through pipe schemes or irrigation companies or those sort of things. It would reduce the ongoing maintenance costs with the need to invest further in this network. Obviously it's closed, there's less money, and over that period we're not going to be investing more. On the negative side, some customers may not want the, rate clo the races closed. So I think we're clear on that one. Some do not want it closed. And, or may not have an alternative source of stock water. So there are some areas of the county that it's quite hard to get stock water, especially in the upper plains. Operational costs of the races to retain the ecological and community benefits, that's what I talked about before, the ecological ones such as Mahangakai and the mudfish and that sort of stuff in some of the streams would likely then move to the general rate payers, because currently it's paid for 90% by a targeted rate on the, the farmer users and 10% target rate, and this would all, a lot more would go to the target general rate, which everybody would pay for that. Questions? Looking at some of the smaller lifestyle blocks, like even ones out at Dremore, they've had a 
prohibitive stock feeding service on their water system for quite a few years now. Um, so they can't legally even give water to sheep or any animals that they've got on their farm, farm lit. So if you close off these water races, who's going to pay for the piping and, and is that going to enable enough water to go into the small lifestyle holdings around Ashburton? So the, the question you're asking is how's the, how are people going to get stock water to farms that don't have it sort of effectively in the small lifestyle blocks, is that right? So I think you should submit on that, and the, the, the answer, we, we talked about it right at the end. We're, we're looking at solutions to the, the problem by, by shutting it. We, we aren't saying we're going to just shut it and walk away. We're shutting it and walking away after three years, so we've put aside some money in our budget to, to look into what, you know, how we would shut it, and that, would, that will lead to better solutions. If pe people can submit their problems, we don't know what problems they have until they've been submitted. No, so the, so the, anybody else to answer? So we, we don't, town supply is for drinking water, and so everybody in our district pays the same amount for drinking water and gets that service, and it's not meant to be for stock water. If, if we exit the service, is what is, which is our preferred option, we've got three years to work through that as to where your water will come from. What's it? We don't know what your problem is either until we decide which preferred option we will take and then whatever that preferred option is will then lead to this is the um, problems we're going to have. Yeah, um, there's other alternatives that you could be collecting the water off your roof to feed your two horses and one sheep. There will be alternatives in most cases, and if there is no alternative, we need to know about it. If we exit the stock water system, we haven't fully decided that yet. That's part of this consultation. Well, perhaps we should, um, as part of a mitigation, if that's the problem at Dromore, allow our stock water to be taken from that drinking water supply. Perhaps that's the answer. So, a suggestion would be welcome. Um, Councillor Wilson, thank you very much for presenting this topic tonight. Um, why is it in the document which I read? on the computer screen just before I come away, the full document, there is no mention of water quality uh, for stock. Uh, we are facing, we are a district that produces lots of milk, meats, different types of animal milk, and yet we have an archaic, smelly system that they, those animals drink out of. We also have a stock water race that produces weeds from the neighbour above, and some of our crops which are hard to control because officially you're not allowed to put Roundup on, and yet Roundup is a proven uh, for fish longevity um, if you can get rid of the, some of the foliage. So why was that not mentioned in the uh, discussion document to actually balance the argument? To me it seems skewed for biodiversity. Now, for history, sir, that decision was made way back in the turn of the century, 1999-2000, um, when the 35, 34 environmental groups asked that the stock water races be closed and, the stock, and the, all the stock water be put in the Ashburton River to make a good river for the people of Ashburton. So why were they not mentioned as other arguments for or against? So probably the, the, when you've talked about the, the cleanliness of the water for stock health and animal health, that's probably where I'd put that under the efficiency of use, because that's where if you go from an open channel ditch into a pipe, it is a lot cleaner and troughs are a lot cleaner. Um, the, the 
environmental reasons was mentioned. We talked about there are other, other reasons for having stock water races. But at the moment, the, the stock water race's primary use is for stock water, and it's funded by farmers and users for stock water. It's not funded as an ecological stream or a, any other users. So that's where the council's saying it doesn't want to be in the stock water business. And that's left, you could say that's left the door open for other uses if the community so wish it, which would then fall on the community to fund rather than on the stock water users. I'm concerned about the level of nitrogen, and I use that word because I get thoroughly confused by nitrates and other variations. Uh, is this stock water going to have any positive or negative effect on nitrogen in groundwater? So currently the council has an agreement with HH Wet, which is the Heinz Hyako Water Trust, which uses it for Ma, and they're trying to reduce the the amount of nitrates in the water. So there is some stock water that's being used for that. So at the moment, the stock water has a zero effect on it because it's, it's just the stock water flowing across the plains. So that's a different argument, you'd say, a different sector with nitrates. When I talk of cleanliness of water, I'm not talking about nitrates. I'm talking about E. coli and bad, quite, you know, bad animal health. That's why you, you wouldn't ever drink the, use the stock water race as a drinking water race for drinking house water out of. Oop. Any more questions? Good. Now we'll move on to Tony. Okay. Key decision five, should we extend EA Network's uh, centre stadium? The stadium at uh, EA Network centre currently has four indoor courts, but at peak times, like after school and at weekends, it doesn't have enough space to meet demand. A study of recreational facilities in the district last year confirmed that sports groups are struggling to get enough court time. Bookings in the stadium have surged from 3,116 hours in 2122 to 4,209 hours in 2223. We're proposing to extend the stadium between years 2029 and 2031 to house more indoor courts. We've investigated two options for extending the stadium and additional two courts could be added for around $16.4 million or three courts for $23.7 million. Both options would take around two years to complete and include additional seating, changing rooms and storage facilities. Doing nothing is also an option. However, this may limit the growth of local sporting opportunities. So there are three options. Council prefers option two. We think extending the stadium with three additional multi-purpose courts would best cater for the needs of local sporting groups and help attract large sporting events to the district. The extension could also be configured to cater for events or shows were seating for 1,500 people. So we uh, option one is a two-court extension, as I said, at a cost of 16.4 million. Uh, the preferred option is a three-court extension, and the third option is do nothing. Can I just say that uh, during peak times, um, bet between 5 and 9 p.m. in the winter, the stadium occupancy is already reaching 96% um, occupancy, and, on, and um, on weekends, on Saturdays, it is at 70%. So uh, the pressure is on uh, that by the time we do get to years 29, 31, the, uh, the need for more um, space uh, will be definitely, definitely needed. Okay, questions? Has there been any plans for a new velodrome or anything to be incorporated into any of these plans? Uh, not that I'm aware of, but that could have been talked about earlier on. I, I can't answer that question.
Uh, Tony, if you go to the preferred option, which you want to do, yep. are you going to have a better traffic management system in place? Because it's blimmin' hopeless getting out of the, uh, the EA networks. When there's a big crowd there, are you going to improve yep. the roading? Uh, well, I think when you see the plan, um, there's a plan uh, for the whole area, um, which includes hockey, uh, hockey uh, turf, etc. There's far bigger um, a parking area, and by then there'd also be another entrance way uh, further along the, by Oak Grove, I think it is. So, so that will be, uh, yeah, when you do the option plan, you know, what you want, the, the three court plan, you'll put that extra roading in. Uh, well, I, I would assume, I would at, assume the that at the same time. We've got money in this year's budget coming up to do something with the entranceway that's there now in and out of um, the EA networks. So that's planned for this year in budget already. Yep. Hi, there's a question here from Tanya on Facebook and she's asking, does the extension include uh, an extension of the existing gym facilities and pool area as well? No, it's just three courts. Just the three courts? Yep. We're done. Good evening, everybody. It's my job to discuss the money, the finances. So we've heard about the, the five key decisions we need to make tonight and the overall operation of the council. So my job is to just outline how the council pay for its day-to-day -day operations and how we would pay for future investments. And of course, we've got various issues will impact our finances over the next 10 years, including legislative changes, compliance, building resilience concerns, population, land use changes, and overall sort of fiscal policy, essentially, nationally and internationally. Um, if you look up there, you can see the key sort of uh, uh, key aspects of the budget. But in simple terms, our day-to-day -day spending to maintain services, i.e., our operating expenses, and that includes, for example, electricity, chemicals, spray, contracting costs, maintenance, depreciation. Importantly, as we alluded to earlier, and obviously wages and salaries, that will increase from $76 million per year, which it is currently up to 121 million by year 10 of the long-term plan. In that time, in that period of time, we have adjusted and put an, an inflation adjustment in there as well. Um, how do we get that um, 76 million dollars currently? Well, currently it comes from rates, um, fees and charges, and we also have government, government subsidies like NZTA give us 51% of our roading overhead, roading costs. So then if we move on to our capital expenditure, so that's these types of concerns like extending the EA networks or doing other key investments, and that would include things like rebuilding the roads or replacing pipes, improving this, this building, improving buildings. Um, that fluctuates over the 10-year period from $26 million to $94 million. And we pay for that through loan funding that we can get at um, a favourable rate through local government. Um, we also can pay for that through the depreciation that we funded for, and we pay for that from investment revenue, for example, forestry reserves. You know, we have some forestry. So that's how we pay for key infrastructure um, activities. Um, and we've got some graphs here that we, you can see, what are you up to now, Mark? Yeah, we'll move on from that. So the next graph, if we look there, you can see the key aspects. We've got um, roading by far, transportation, that's roading takes it, and footpaths, takes up the bulk of our expenditure in 25-26. And we've got um, spending on drinking water, which will continue to be an um, expense over a few years. Wastewater, stormwater, all those other aspects that counts are involved in. Again, inflation is assumed. And if we go on um, the next slide, we wanted to show you this, I want to slow you this slide very quickly. If you look at 25, 26 and 26, 27, you can see a big bump up there and that's a government um, contribution towards our new bridge. 
So optimistically, assuming that they will um, honour the um, the verbal sort of expectation there. If we move over to our debt levels, if we look at our debt levels over the next 10 years, we use debt, as I said, to fund expenditure that will benefit current and also future residents of residents and ratepayers. So we'll benefit our the EA Networks extension, for example, will benefit our great great grandchildren. So they will have to pay a portion of that. So that's like, as we said, drinking water treatment plants, wastewater infrastructure and recreational facilities. Over the life of this long-term plan, this is projected to peak at about 197 million, and that's in year 2029 to 2030. That, and then over that, by the end of the 2034, that will be down to about, I think, 151 million, yes. It's interesting to note that the 197 million represents about 20% of the total assets owned by council. It equates to roughly $3,900 per resident in the district. These debt levels are sustainable by all the parameters that we measure it over the next 10 year period. And reassuringly, our Fitch credit rating is, has been AA plus since 2019. Um, I'm going to stop there and Neil's going to carry on, but does anybody have any questions about that a little bit? Looking that we have a uh, long-term plan meeting like this every three years, is that yes. right? Yes, that's right. Yep. And I was here three years ago listening to the last long-term plan and most of these things in here other than the hydro side were not in it. So we're looking at approximately another three long-term plan meetings like this with an extra probably, what, 50 odd million dollars each meeting that we're wanting to spend. Is that taking into account that in those figures? Or are we looking at every three years that we're looking at changing infrastructure and stuff or building new projects going to add on to that value? I don't know how to answer that, but essentially in three years' time, are we going to wipe all these and start a whole new set of projects? Is that what you're suggesting? Or are we going to add new projects in? Like the EA Networks extension is a 30-year project. So each successive council can review those decisions that were made and based on the environment can decide whether to progress, modify or not progress projects. Yep. But at the moment, we're looking at possibly spending how many million dollars on these five y projects? Yes, yeah, well, some okay. of them are not, uh, there's an option of no, no yep. option, but they are but included if they in, are done, yeah, which yes. chances yeah. are they will be, then in another three years' time, there'll be other infrastructure programs that you're wanting to start that are going to add on to that bill, and then in three years later after that, you're going to have the same thing. So your 2033, 20, 20, 34 figure is going to be out by about probably, I'd say, 100 million. Well, we hope not, because that would be putting it in a much more, less affordable realm. Um, no, we don't, well, we can't predict, we can't, you know, we can't predict what will happen with the next council, but that is not the expectation that they would scrap this and start again and invest something else or like a, whatever. Well, the, the successive councils may decide that. They may well decide that. We can't predict what the successive, what future councils. Beg your pardon? Have any in the past? Said that we're not, well, for example, we're not, this council decided not to progress with the road, the new road entranceway into the domain because we felt it was a bit beyond our costs at the moment. So we, we do, each council review, reviews things as, they, as we go through. But also we don't know what we don't know. Yeah. So That, that we suddenly have to spend money on and we'll have to put into a plan. Mm. Mm. So, yeah, it's very hard. You can only predict what you know. That's why we do this every three years to try and stay on top of that. Because, yeah, you just, it's very hard to, to know what you, you can't don't know. You can't anticipate, yeah. yeah. Or a change in regulation that tells us we have to bring something up to a different level. Like, we, we um, just, uh, man, developed a domain redevelopment plan last council and some of those projects have not moved forward thus far and they've been pushed out because we didn't have the resources to support those, those projects at the moment. So they're not always going to go ahead, you know. Is that fair?
Any Tori questions? Carroll. G'day. Um, I want you to go back to the slide, please, for the operatic expenditure. Yeah, sure. And I'll refresh your memory. Yeah, you thanks. Said you, thanks. Your cost will increase, the operating expenditure will increase from $76 million yes. to $121 million yes. in the next 10 years. 10 years, yeah. That's over a third of what we've got already. It's over a third of what we've got now. How can you justify that sort of increase over 10 years? You know? Well, there's inflation in built into that. There's inflation in there in those figures. So that will. Well, You've that's been calling more politicians, I think. <laughs> Maybe it's gone. What, what's inflation now? It's well. It's, yeah. Well, let's wait and see. Yeah. Um, and there's also the projects are in that. A lot of the operations expenses, like our water regulation, is is getting more and more stringent. There's going to have to be more investment in water. Um, there's, uh, you know, that's just a the way the world goes, essentially. There's going to be more activity going on, so that's that's what's it costed out at. Anybody got any comment on that? Just okay. as an example, in our budget, we've um, put an extra 20% into roading, and what that's going to achieve for our district is what we got two years ago, and that's the impact that inflation has had on roading. So that's over a two-year period. Rate of inflation, why are the um, council rates going up as much as 9.9 per cent? 9.9 per cent near one? Is that, yeah. is is that it, what the question was? Sorry, I can't hear you very well. Oh, sorry. Uh, 9.9 per cent on the first year. I suppose, what are we looking at the same over the next three years, is it? Uh, the first year, and then it goes up. I think six points. Neil's going to the, the mayor's going to talk about that, but I think it's six point six seven percent or something the the following year and around that for the next the following year after that. Uh, um, our, our rate uh, rate projected rate increases, which we have not been confirmed, uh, actually. I mean, I, I think that's a lot of money, but they're actually quite modest compared to other districts in New Zealand at the moment. I, I know you're comparing yeah. it with other yeah. councils. Uh, they're obviously. I'm well, sorry, I can't hear you very the, well. The other councils are obviously poorly run, in my view, um, but we're still increasing more than rate of inflation. That is how, true. How, do, but we've got how to, do people and this you know, cost of living crisis going to cope with that? We are improving our level of service, and, the, and as we've seen, we've got the, the projects that we've identified that we're looking for feedback on, and they'll obviously cost. We're um, doing more in our water, stock water, storm water, wastewater areas that we have to do by legislation. We have to put the green bins in through legislation. So central government is putting a lot of um, demands and placing a lot of expectations on local bodies, and that actually costs. And we have had many, many conversations around the council table because we're all very aware of the cost of living, and we're all... Um, conscious of the impact that has on the ratepayer and trying to keep that down. And we feel confident that that 9.9% um, is a, a reasonable amount in, the, in this time. I mean, I'm, I'm not denying it's a lot of money for people, but it's, it's the best we can do at this stage. But when we get feedback in and consultation in and things will be wiggled around and some things will go ahead, some things will not, then we can you know, have a, a firm a, a number and see what, if it changes. Yeah. Thank you. Anything else? No? <laughs> Pass you over to the Mayor. <laughs> Thank you, Carolyn. Um, I'll talk about the key projects. <clears throat> Just following up on a point over here about um, this is a 10 year plan with a focus on three years. So when we stood here three years ago, we had um, budgets and pr um, projects in our budget year four, five, and six, which have now moved to year one, two, and three. And the year seven, eight, nines have moved to four, five, six. If they've made, if this group of uh, councillors believe they were worthy of moving forward, if they weren't, they were removed, and there could be some new ones that the council decided went in. So we are a ten-year plan, and um, I'll talk about some of those projects for Ashburton right now. <clears throat> and every, everyone contributes to projects such as roading upgrades across the district, parks, and recreations facilities. 
and here's an overview of some of the key projects that are specifically for, in this LTP for Ashburton. And in year one, we're going to spend um, $7 million on drinking water UV upgrade for the Ashburton drinking water. In years four to 10, we're going to spend Ashburton drinking water on peri-urban water servicing, and that's in year the four to 10. So as we do the stand here in three years' time, those ones at four to 10 will move forward. Uh, Ashburton drinking water main renewals, year one, there's $175,000 to be spent here in Ashburton. Year two, $1.4 million to be spent in Ashburton. And year three, $1.9 million on water main renewals in Ashburton. And years four to 10, there's $9.6 million to be spread over those years on water main renewals. We do them every year. We've also got an Ashburton wastewater money to be spent on. We call it a grit chamber. Don't ask what it is. It's something we need and it's a $7 million job to put a grit chamber in on our wastewater, and that is year one, <clears throat> which is not there at the moment. So that's an increased level of service we didn't have before, but it's a must do to keep the wastewater systems working. Stormwater, we've got an attenuation, mains and treatment. We're spending nothing in year one, but in year two, we're spending $2.5 million on stormwater. Year three, we're spending $7.2 million on Ashburton stormwater. And in years four to 10, it's community $15 million on stormwater. Um, Ashburton Second Bridge, we're budgeted on $2.6 million in year one. Year two is $56 million, and in year three, $57 million. And to quantify that, we're also expecting the bulk of those monies to come from government, but we need to put them in our plan to, and, and get them back again. So we're budgeting for it, but um, wanting to get those monies back. Um, Ashburton Domain Projects, year one, $350,000 to be spent in the domain. Year two, $800,000 to be spent in the domain. Year three, $285 million. <laughs> and in years four to 10, $4.3 million on the domain. <clears throat> and Ashburton Museum Display, We've said that it's not that important at this stage. We've put that in year four to 10 of 2.8 million. Another council will decide whether that project goes ahead or not in three years time, because it'll move from whatever year it's in, four to 10, to um, forward. And the EA Network Centre internal building changes and the entrance widening, widening we talked about before, one for the, um, uh, for the dancing if it, if it was moved there, and the other was for the entrance widening, which we talked to uh, about before to alleviate the ins and outs of there. 550,000 has been budgeted in this year. All those monies are um, capital projects which go towards um, the rate increase. They've got to be paid for. If you don't want us to do them, let us know. Now's the time. <clears throat> so running a district doesn't come cheap. Much like many households in New Zealand, we're facing big increases to costs of providing services. This slide shows what an average ratepayer rates are spent on and roughly how much it costs everyone um, each week. Yep. Everyone's rates are different and how much you pay depends on where you live, changes to the capital value of your property and the type of property you have, whether it's a rural or residential, and the services your property receives e.g. Uh, drinking water or rubbish collection or wastewater disposal. To meet these inflationary pressures and realise our plans for the district, overall rates are proposed to increase about 30% in the next three years, and that is including inflation. It sounds a lot, but this translates to around an additional $300 annually for an average Ashburton residential property. And mentioned before, the average rate rise across New Zealand at the moment is, um, is looking at 15%. And some, the highest council, I think, is at 25% rate rise this year coming. And we're looking at increasing rates for this first year, year one, of 9.9. .9. And over the next 10 years, we're proposing an average rate increase of 6.4. Then we've got the rates by community. <clears throat> Easy for you to read, mine's a wee bit smaller, but you can see there that um, a require, an Ashburton residential property with an average capital valuation of 441000 is looking at an increase of about 10% in the 24-25 year, about an extra $5.50 per week. Rakaia, if anyone's interested or comes from Rakaia, a $366,000 house there will have an increase of 9.4%. 
about an extra four dollars eighty. Methven property, four hundred and thirty five thousand dollar value house there, twelve point five per cent increase, six dollars ninety a week. And Ashburton commercial property with an average value of one point two five million will have an increase of at six point nine per cent or three hundred and twenty seven dollars, about six dollars thirty per week. Um, so there's the examples of um, of some examples of, of rate rises to the district. But everyone's different, it depends on your capital value um, as to the rates you actually pay. We'll have, hand over now to what's happening to fees. I think it's, is that Lane? Uh, Lane. Oh, sorry, no, it's me. I'm still here. <coughs> sorry. <laughs> One more page. Sorry, Lane. So what's happening to fees in 24-25? We're also increasing fees, uh, proposed fees to increase uh, about 6% for uh, all the fees and charges. That's like um, registering your dog, um, building inspections, all those um, things that council does and charge for. Looking at a new membership structure for the EA Networks Centre and um, changes to the fees that we charge at the airport for landing and taking off planes um, hangers out there, etc. So um, now we can hand over to Lane. <laughs> Mark, you're pretty good. Can you bring it a little bit higher? Good evening. Um, I was the last one in the door, so I get the bips and the bobs. So basically, what, what else are we doing with consulting? What are we doing? And what are we changing for our key, key policies? We've got the revenue and finance policy, and that sets out how the community pays for council activities and services. Stock water, for example, and I'm one of the guys who has to pay this, from 260 to $700 per year. Great postponement policy. That is a policy that enables residential ratepayers to seek postponement of rates for reasons of financial hardship. What are some other changes to the policies? The rates remission policy. It enables council to remit rates under certain circumstances where it is fair and reasonable. Development and financial contribution policy. Updating the fee schedules to reflect the cost of growth. Mount Summers, with all the new buildings there, has got a new DC. And a more flexible approach to multiple re residential de development. Community engagement policy. That basically helps us to make the right, the right conversations with the right people at the right time. For example, you being here sitting and be listening. The policy set out the fra framework for us to identify the level of significant attached to an issue proposal or decision and how we should be consulting with our community. Now I've got something that says a slight width map. What am I looking at? This is the last one and we talked about it before, you know, 10 years and 30 years. The EA Network Centre and surrounding lands, we've got a 30 year plan for that. So. If council doesn't, and in those, those 30 years, for example, um, we, we will have a solar farm there as well. So for the EA Centre, we were trying to get most of it done with solar. There's extensions for the swimming, for the stadium. The hockey turf is going to be there over the years. Multiple multi-purpose sport fields. Mini golf, 
playgrounds and outdoor courts. We are consulting on the whole master plan. And council, over the last six, seven years that I've been part of it, what was in the 10-year plan might have been cha changed. Why? Because we couldn't afford it, or we think it's better in year seven. So we certainly work 10 years, the three years, what has been said before, the, the seven years we, we start again, and three come on the end. But just due to the money, we can do certain things, or we can do it. And you can tell us that. Um, <clears throat> so basically there's a plan there, and a development plan, what you can see above me. And basically all that, just to make sure, you and us, we own the whole network, you know, the EA Network Center. It's owned 100% by council, and you, we are part of your council. It started off with 35 million, and it was finished and opened on the 9th of May 2015. And it started off in 2007. The initial site selection, building design, and subsequent land purchase by council were made with an eye to the future, with the intention of expanding the current centre to create a large sporting hub. The AI Network Centre plays an important role in market, making our district a great place, place to live. We know that the asset is valued by the community. It is good for the well-being, and it's also a good benefit for our, our di district with larger events here as well. It keeps the centre relevant to our growing and changing district. Any questions? Okay, okay, yeah. Is it there? Not? Let's go. It is, of course. There, there was a question before about car parking. You'll see car parking up there in this plan, um, more extended out from where it is now. Mm. Can you ask how many welcome Ashburton signs that we have in Ashburton? How many welcome Ashburton signs do we have in Ashburton? I don't know. I'm asking. <laughs> because For in here, we've got. Installing welcome to Ashburton signage, $161,000 in year four. That's a hell of a lot of money for signage. No, no, no. no. So to summarise, um, to start off I want to um, kind of congratulate Council on the job that they're doing uh, in regard to this consultations um, and the, some of the uh, uh, projects that have, uh, you've talked about that require have, uh, financial discipline uh, to, to uh, and you've, you've, you've been careful about where you spend your money. Um, I'm looking at a proposed master plan for the EA network and I'm thinking, I know it's 30 years, but we're in a cost of living crisis now. Um, I'm proud that Ashburton is still a reasonably affordable place to live. Um, and I really want it to stay that way. Uh, yeah. I'm looking at, at, at all this is going to cost a lot of money, uh, and, um, and 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 you know, we're going to is Ashburton going to lose its status of a of, of an affordable place to live and become like a lot of the other councils around that are we're kind of running vanity projects and you know 15, 20 percent rate rises and 
it's, it's not, what, not what we want to see. And that's basically what we've been doing around the table. We are talking, and certainly we make decisions. And a 30-year plan, if we can't afford it, it might be a 40-year. You know, we, we are you know, we're not silly. If I could just add, add to that, Lane. Yep. We, did, we did a 30-year development plan on the Ashburton Domain a couple of years ago, and there's lots of stuff in there. doesn't mean we've got to do them all year one, two, and three. It's to be done over 30 years, or perhaps not at all. And it's a living document, so it can change as things change as well. In that plan up there, there's sports fields, there's rugby fields. We, we've got about six hectares of spare land there, which we acquired when we built the first stadium. So if someone comes to us in 10 years' time or 15 years' time or more and says, we want to put a rugby field on the EA Network site, that's where it goes. So, and then someone wants to come and put the um, a community turf on, which is like a hockey turf, that's where it goes. So it's a good plan going forward for when someone wants to develop. Council may not pay for any of it, but if people want to put the turf on or put the rugby field or soccer field on, that's where it goes. We'll sort the payment system out through this long-term plan process. So it doesn't mean we'll do it, but it's provisioning for doing it in the future if it is required and people want to do it. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, I just want to see yeah. council go nuts and spending. It, it, might, it might be, but people are asking for it. So our community yeah. wanted to get done. So we try to do it with the money we've got. And, and if they do want to do it, we'll run it through this long-term plan process so you'll get to have a say on it. In 5, 10, 20 years' time, whatever it is, mm -hmm. it will go through this process. And some of the clubs really are quite keen to get there. Of course, you've got car, car park, you've got it all together. But it costs money. We've got three questions oh. just coming from Facebook. <laughs> um, so Sean is asking in the master plan, why is there only a 25 metre pool and not a 50 metre pool planned? Cost. <laughs> and 50, 50 metre pool is just really out of it. We can't afford it. And hey, after 25 metres, I'm on my knees in the bottom of the pool. I can't even get back. Well, that, that's what we're proposing. But if he thinks we should have a 50 metre pool, put a submission in to that 30-year um, plan. That's what he needs to do. We can extend uh, uh, the pool in 10 volt. Uh, we have another question here from Louis, who's asking, uh, what about a sauna? Any plans on adding that to the facility? as well, which would be great for winter time. Yeah, there is. Yeah, there is. There is an hot, an hot chamber there. It's it next to the pool. There's one. There's a steam yeah, there's, there room that exists yeah. there currently. Yeah, there is one. Put a submission in, okay. And then um, we have Dave, who has asked if there are any figures available on the EA Network Centre's current profitability. I don't, I listen, I'm going to listen to the ladies, they know it all. So we report on our financials every month, and that includes our EA Sports, and we rely on fees and charges, which I think we heard earlier is around a 30% split fees and charges, and rating the difference. And a lot of those things, you know, at, at, the, at the EA Centre, yeah, people don't pay full prices. So it comes back to council, back to council, we all pay. We want it, we have to pay for it. Uh, just on that question, can you tell us, I think Neil might have alluded to it at, last night, but what are the, what's the income and what's the expenditure of EA networks per year? 
I don't know it out of my head, you, you know. Uh, just, we spend just about $7 million a year, and just under $7 million a year on it, and fees and charges are around about $2 million of that. So the rest is picked up by the ratepayer. And that is not the only council is doing that. Pardon? <laughs> That's it. Oh, Lynette. Okay, I'm the virtually next to last here tonight. You've, you've heard a lot and um, hopefully we, you'll be able to go back and watch it on, face, on, on, our, on our line. And, um, and please take all those books home with you to refresh your memories for when you're going to fill out our, our forms or online. So my bit is how to have your say. And the easiest way to provide your feedback to us is online, airplace.nz. There is a hard copy available here to, I think you might all have one of those. Um, and, you, and if you look in the back and your comments bits aren't big enough, put another page in there and staple it to it and hand it in. Um, there, and online also there's more detailed background information and additional information there for you as well to, to make a good informative decision. Now your submission can be on any of these topics or anything else you think will make a, the district a better place. If you can think of anything else we've missed or that's very important to you that we should know about um, someone said to me they wanted curb and channelling down in a small village and they said, well, put it in there, put it in your comments, put it in your submission, because we don't know what we don't know out there. So please put it in. Now we do have a, a formal submission process. All individual submissions and summary will be presented to council. Every councillor here is expected to read every one of them and, and they will be yeah, presented and in a short form as well. And you can also come and talk to council about your submission. So there is a wee box on there, tick it, and you'll be given a time to come and talk to the council. And you've seen this all here tonight, we're not frightening. So. <laughs> Come and talk to us, and we ask you a few questions on your submission. So never feel threatened coming in to, to visit us, us lot in there at all. And, um, and if you don't think our options are right, what we've, what we've underlined, tell us and, and, give, you, and give us your, your thoughts. And, and, you know, just add, add it there and add more pages and stuff. So um, we're halfway through a public um, consultation with community events. And on the back of those, you'll find the list of um, more community meetings. So please tell your friends and neighbours to come and listen. You know, listen to us. And we, we do value your feedback. And the process from here is submissions finish on the 28th of April and then we go um, and consult on the, on the plan. Uh, 13th to the 16th of May are the council hearings, that's when you come, can come in and talk to us and we sit there with all the written ones. And the, and the deliberations when we make those decisions of what we've got run between the 20th, 24th of May. The 27th of June, um, the council by then would have um, confirmed our 10-year plan and then it becomes operative on the 1st of July. So that's, 
that's it all from me, and I'll ask Sunil if he would like to thank everybody, and do you want to do a wee wrap-up? I'll do a wrap-up, thanks. Yeah, thanks thank you. I'd just like to thank the councillors for coming out tonight and um, presenting what they were presenting. Uh, thank staff for putting all this together for in, the, in the background. It's very helpful to display, and that's a great job they've done. But most importantly, I'd like to thank yourselves for coming out, listening, asking questions, and getting to know what we are planning. So if you haven't still got all the information you need, we're going to open these doors and have a cup of tea and a biscuit. So we'll still be here. So if you want to talk to us one-on-one, -on -one, you can do that now too. So, um, But thanks all for coming out and we'll close the session. Thank you.